Hello everyone, welcome back to Mother Forever. I'm one of your hosts, Oranges Borange, and I'm here with Echoes and Nokolo, and we have another interview uh, that we did, and uh, this is with the Mother 3 fan translation uh, staff, Jeff Man. Hey. <laughs> and uh, to start off our discussion, we should begin by asking what your background with the Mother series has been. Uh, where did you first discover the games? So I started off with Earthbound. I grew up in the 90s, so we grew up with the Super Nintendo, and I got Earthbound for my birthday, I think the year after it came out, um, and I just kind of played it from there as a kid. I wasn't very good at it because I was so young, but uh, I played it, and I think it took me several years to finally beat it. Um, but yeah, that's how I got started, just way back in... 95 96 ish right so there you like, go so did you so when when did you actually finish earthbound did you like finish it much later on in your lifetime or yeah uh -huh. um probably like five or six years later i had gotten stuck actually <laughs> i got stuck in winters um it was just too difficult for me to get past um so i just put it down for a bit and i kept going back at it, kept giving up because it was just too hard, but eventually I just uh, figured out how to actually win at the game, and then I was able to beat it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's like any kid. I think I was stuck in on it for like three months or something. <laughs> I remember getting stuck in Threed. <laughs> yeah, when it, so when I first played... Um... When I first played Earthbound, I actually had a Super Famicom at the time, and I, I had played Mother 2 first. So it was one of my first games I, I thought it was, you know, normal for everything to be in Japanese and some language I couldn't understand. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, that didn't work so well. I didn't play, I didn't finish Earthbound itself, like, as an English game on a, on a, on an emulator or so until, like, I was, like, around 16, 17 years old. So much, much later. But uh, it's really interesting to always hear what other, like, their experiences with the Mother series and how they got into it. Yeah, it's interesting because, like, when, because it seems like a lot of us got stuck pretty early in the game. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's like, the game changes quite a bit after those points. Like, it, especially after you start getting all the characters and such. It's, um, it's like we only touched a small part of it before really diving into it. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's go ahead. Uh, of course. Yep. Yeah, so you're most well known as the programmer on the Mother 3 fan translation. But before you began work on that project, where did you first begin interest in programming? So I think it must have been about four years before, I'd say. About four years before the project is when I started programming. Um, I was like young teenager I guess uh, <laughs> I started just on like really simple visual basic fix kind of stuff uh, I wasn't very good of course cause I was just a kid um, but what I actually applied my programming stuff to first was earthbound hacking um, this was back probably in the 2002-2003 time frame I developed a lot of my programming skills from like making earthbound hacking tools. Uh, I made some tools that were kind of similar to PK Hack, even though we already had PK Hack. Um, but like, I just wanted to kind of reinvent it so I could learn how to program it on my own as well. And then eventually I came up with new tools that hadn't been done before. Um, and then eventually once Mother 3 came out, I figured it'd be a good opportunity to to develop my skills further and then to be able to contribute something a bit more to the community. Oh, of course. Do you remember kind of like if you did any PK hacks, what kind of silly ideas you had? <laughs> I probably did like some really silly stuff, nothing too substantial. I don't think I ever released anything, but I'm sure I made all kinds of silly hacks with my friends, like changing around the sprites or changing the text to make people swear or something dumb like that. Oh, okay. Playing around like pork, basically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The yeah. one, the one, the one hack that I remember the most, like when I was uh, around in Starman, like a little bit 
earlier, like in 2006, 2008, there was this hack that changed the battles from the normal Earthbound backgrounds and everything to similar to like Chrono Trigger. And okay. I, I thought that was like the most interesting thing that I've ever seen because it like it changed how Earthbound was how how Earthbound's mechanics uh, overall with another game that I particularly enjoyed. So I always was very fond of uh, the hacking scene because you know I wasn't I wasn't capable of it at the time, but you know I, I admired it from afar. So it's it's interesting to hear someone's thoughts of like you know their their up upbringing from. You know what they were interested in yeah it's kind of i was there with like through a really good time i think because when i first got involved the kinds of tools we had were quite primitive um we really just had like the original pk hack version 2 or whatever from uh that was written by tomato actually tomato and span off and we didn't have a whole lot more than that but over those couple of years that i spent with the pk hack community we developed some really really cool stuff like uh mr accident made the map the first map editor for example which really opened a lot of doors for hacking and then eventually uh mr tendo developed or anyone eb and then mr tendo developed uh the modern pk hack which is java based and now we've got coil snake which like recompiles the whole game so it's actually really neat the kind of technology we have now and how it's developed over the years interesting Seems like a lot of the projects built on each other. Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'll like move an... on. Oh, sorry. <laughs> well, I was gonna say, yeah, it's like an incredible domino effect. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's always building off the loss, and like there was always we had like a really active uh, IRC channel where we would constantly share documentation and stuff and share our discoveries. So. There was a it was a really thriving and feed forward community. We were constantly learning new things and developing new tools. Yeah, all right. So I'll leave it off to you, Mr. Cody. All right. <laughs> so there were a few other Mother 3 translation projects before yours and Tomatoes came to fruition. Were you involved in any capacity with the previous Mother 3 translation projects? Uh yeah. So the ones that I remember, there was there was the do-it-yourself devotion from Starman.net. Um, they started maybe in November-ish, 2006. Um, I was not involved in that one. That was uh, Clyde and Gideon C. And uh, Neo Demi Force, I think. Yeah, I think those were the three. Um, mm -hmm. But before that, actually, right when the game came out, I was involved in a project called Mother3.org. Um, so I was quite involved in that project. I tried doing the the hacking, the programming on that. We didn't get that far with mm -hmm. it. Um, and unfortunately, I started to kind of drown in a pool of drama. And oh. the place eventually got kind of... It just stopped. Like, mm -hmm. the activity stopped. People kind of lost hope. Right. Um, right. And it just kind of got abandoned kind of got became like a very stressful environment for you and a lot of people just seemed to just kind of distance themselves over a period of time because of what was going on yeah it was yeah. it was hard to get around all that stuff it was hard to stay focused and to really get work done because there was always something else going on and uh yeah eventually we just left mm -hmm. right yeah right. did that uh make you hesitant to jump on tomatoes project or were you cool being familiar with who he is mm -hmm. um kind of the opposite i actually wanted to i wanted to get away from all the i guess nonsense from mother3.org and just really get to work <laughs> <Right>. yeah <laughs> so i mean i i actually approached reed about it um i brought up the idea with him to see if they'd be interested in just kind of combining our efforts you know like we've mm -hmm. got something we don't have a lot but from other3.org we do have something on the hacking and the translation and we did have a couple people who we were like really cool with who weren't really part of the whole drama or anything so i just i fielded it with uh with readman just to see if it's something that they'd be interested in and to my surprise they actually were i 
I was skeptical that they would just because of all the drama that was surrounding the project, but uh, they were they were on board with it. So yeah, they yeah. just wanted to play the game in English, man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. They tried. A lot of people did. <laughs> right, and you you took that you know that uh, negative instance and negative situation, you made it a positive one. You turned in, tra changed it to something that could, you know, be more constructive, be more productive and what you wanted to do. So, you know, good on you for that. Um, <laughs> I did have, you know, my, my thoughts were, you know, you know, Clyde, Clyde Mandolin is, is a pretty, you know, knowledgeable and successful translator, you know, being involved with localizations like Kingdom Hearts 2, Steins Gate, and even anime like Dragon Ball or Funimation Inter Entertainment. So how did you two exactly meet? Do you still keep in touch or anything? Or have you released any other translations or anything like that so, together? So I only, before the project, I only knew him from Starman, like on the forums and such. Um, I had never, this was my first project with him. I had never worked on anything with him, be it a translation or a tool or whatever. Um, so we had interactive kind of briefly on the forums here and there, but we weren't really close. Um, but throughout the project, we definitely became close because we worked on it nearly every day for a good year and a half, I would say. Um, we talked a lot. It was always just online written text. We never, back then, we didn't really have the technology we have now with Discord and such. It was like, we might have had Skype back then, but not a lot of people used it. Um, so we we interacted just online through. We had like a little, almost like a message board that we used to to develop the translation. Um, and we didn't actually meet for the first time until Camp Fan Gamer. Oh wow! wow. Really? Wow! wow. Yeah, was Way later. Yeah, Way later. Almost. It's got to be seven years after the thing was even released so, that's yeah. impressive that's when we met for the first time uh, i was wow. surprised by how tall he was he's quite tall i'm i'm a little bit above average height but like i met clyde and he's like a giant so mm -hmm. um <laughs> yeah no that was it was really cool to finally meet him um then i met a lot of other fan gamer and starman folks at camp fan gamer as well um we had a little panel actually on the mother three translation I it's think on, I it's on went YouTube to that. Somewhere. Um, I found it actually on Stephen George's YouTube because he's. I don't know if you're familiar with Stephen Plays or Stephen's blog, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, he's. It's on there. He went to Camp Fan Gamer. He filmed the whole thing. So, oh, if that's you good. See that, then yeah, I'll, uh, I could dig up a link for you. Sure. Yeah, we're 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 very familiar of uh, Stephen George <laughs> and and Mal and all yeah, of them. Yeah, we're big fans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so I was actually at that camp fan gamer. It was pretty fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think I went to your panel. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, it was fun. It was really cool to have an opportunity to you know meet Clyde and then get to talk about that kind of stuff for the fans. I people were like asking for my autograph afterwards for their handbooks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not used to that kind of thing, but it was just kind of cool. The whole camp fan gamer was just it was a really surreal experience. Honestly, mm -hmm. like. Just all these people, who most of whom I've only known online, just all coming together yeah. and just not caring about anything but Earthbound for three days it was a really cool experience. <laughs> have, jokingly, I'm assuming, have you ever had like anyone come out and be like, "Jeffman, Jeffman, sign my Mother Three reproduction <laughs> cartridge." <laughs> oh boy! No, that hasn't happened yet. Oh okay, because <laughs> like I, I know, I know, I know a lot of um, I know a lot of the. Uh, I think the 1.2 version of the translation has uh, been on a lot of. Yeah, and, and, that's yeah. the one that's been out for the longest. I think. Yeah, and and I just thought maybe jokingly you had someone that <laughs> got an English <laughs> copy and you're like, sign it. I'm a big fan. <laughs> um, thank. Yeah. You know, I just got what is it? My banana peels, right? <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Yeah, so if I recall, prior to the translation project, there weren't any reliable tools for hacking Mother 3. You developed many of the tools, such as Mother 3 Funland, which opened up the possibility for hacking the game. Where did you begin in, begin in creating these tools, and what were the difficulties in making them? So the, 
the funny thing about Mother 3 Funland is that it's not fun at all. It's a <laughs> terrible program, but I... So yeah, you're right, there were pretty much no tools whatsoever before the project, so we had to do a lot of it from scratch. And it's kind of daunting when you... Like, you almost... Coming from the Earthbound Hockey community, where everything is so deeply and in such detail documented for how the game works and how all the data is stored, and then you come to Mother 3, which has, like, absolutely nothing. Um, so when I was working on the first project at Mother3.org, part of the hacking knowledge that we did bring over um, was just that base level of documentation about, at the very least, how the text is stored. Um, because that's one of the first places you want to start, right? Is you want to dump all the text from the game so that the translators can get started. Um, so we had to do a lot of it from scratch. And Mother 3 Funland was a tool that I had started uh, for Clyde, actually. He wanted some kind of... He didn't want to just edit stuff in a text editor because it was difficult to navigate. There's a, there's like... He said if you were to print out the game's text on like 8.5 by 11 paper, it would be about 800 pages long. Oh jeez! Wow. So <laughs> That's kind insane. Kind of difficult to to navigate through that in a text editor. So mm -hmm. he wanted some kind of tool to be able to a let him organize and just navigate the game's text, and b he also wanted it to to show a preview of how the text would look in game. Oh, um, because you wanna you wanna know That's how the text is gonna look visually, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Because um, yeah. it's gonna affect how you translate it and how you write it. Because right. like one of the biggest constraints is that when you're displaying dialogue on the game screen, it only shows two lines at a time. Um, so if you're translating a really long thought or idea and you can't fit it on two lines, then you're going to have to be able to see that and you're going to have to adjust accordingly. Right. So that was the main reason for it. Um, and then we added a couple extra buttons on there for like compiling the text and analyzing it for blanks and duplicates and whatnot. So it's... It just kind of grew incrementally over the course of the project, but um, I, like I was like programming skills for that kind of thing were really poor back then, so the source code didn't mess. Um, I don't think I even have the source code anymore, but you can decompile it. Um, but yeah, it was developed. Mother Three Funland was a tool developed for the translation mainly for Clyde, um, and it yeah, it was just based on what little knowledge we had of the game. And then after, probably during or after the translation project, I had developed some other tools. I dug a bit deeper into the game's data. Like, I didn't stop once the thing was released. I also wanted to learn how the sprites were formatted, for example, or how the battle backgrounds were formatted. So I started documenting a bunch of that stuff and developed a few tools for that, too. Yeah, and people are still learning more about uh, how the game works till this day. That, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, so off to you, Mr. Cody. All right. I've heard that many of the enemy names in the translation were provided by the community at Starman.net, including puns like Slitherhat. <laughs> <laughs> were you involved in any of these, uh, creating any of these names, or did you provide input anywhere else in the translation? Uh, no, I wish. Um, I'm not much of a creative type, and I definitely could not come up with anything even close to the awesomeness of Slytherhen. Um, <laughs> so, no. But I think I admire the translators that they're able to come up with things like that. Cause there's a lot of really clever puns and, and other translations in the game, actually. Um, yeah, do you have I, a favorite? My favorite's probably Facade. Um, and that's, like, oh, yeah. uh, it, it has mixed it had mixed feedback, actually. There were a lot of people who didn't really like it. Um, oh. But it is clever on so many levels. It's... I think, like, I'm trying to remember, there were, like, three different things that kind of all came together for that translation to make so much sense. Like, like you've got, just phonetically, facade sounds like facade with a facade, C, right? Which means right. something yeah. fake. Yeah. It's not what it seems to be. And as you play the game, you find out that he, the character is not who you think he is. Right. Um it's also like kind of Arabic sounding and the character is he, he's of Arabic or he's portrayed as someone of Arabic descent as well. And then I think the third thing was 
in Arabic, I think the word facade means greed or something like that. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I, yeah, right. I don't quite you remember, but yeah. like there were three totally separate but complementary things that made that translation so brilliant. Um, so that's definitely one of my favorites. Okay. Yeah, there are so many different parts to that translation yeah. that were yeah. pretty awesome. It has layers like an ogre. <laughs> 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 so, um, so when when it comes to the programming side of the translation, what was some of the most like difficult things to uh, the, like? What was the difficult barrier to overcome? Is there like anything you feel that you could perhaps have improved on even now or even future patches, like as you were working and progressing through that? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, one of the so the fundamental thing that we had to do for the hacking was what's called a variable with font or VWF. Mm -hmm. um, what we could have done and what we were doing at the start at mother3.org actually was you don't really need to hack the game at all to translate it because like there is an english font in the game it's it supports encoding of english characters mm -hmm. you could in theory translate the game as is just by translating the text and not hacking anything else and release that um the problem is that the font is so like the characters are so big and you can only fit so many letters on the screen at once is that it's going to be terrible if you did that. So it pretty well necessitates the need for a variable with font, which is where each letter, each character on the screen has its own width. So you can put, like, you know, the letter I is very skinny uh, compared to the letter mm -hmm. W, which is very wide. So it lets you pack the letters tightly together so you can fit way more characters on the screen at once. And uh, that'll enable a much better translation overall. So being able to do that v VWF for the game, it was difficult, but it was also time consuming because what ended up happening was we found out that many of the different parts of the game, like there's the dialogue where you're seeing who's talking, the text box at the bottom, but then there's also like the menus. There's also the file select screen. There's the music player. There's the battle screen. Um, there's all these different parts of the game that seemed like they were all done by a different programmer and so they didn't tend to reuse a lot of the same code so we didn't have to do just one vwf we had to do several oh okay so oh, that's and, fun. yeah what a uh, what about um what about say involvement about say like the the, the unused memo screen for example or, or that the... was actually we kind of discovered that by accident um what happened was at the beginning of the game, or at the beginning of the project, when we were dumping the text out of the game, uh, we quickly saw that there was a pattern in the text data. Like every block of text data had a had a header with a magic number that you could easily search for mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. game's ROM. Um, mm -hmm. So you could identify exactly where all of the text tables were in the game, and you would know that you had gotten them all. And there was one text table in the game that, for the longest time, we could not figure out what it was for because we couldn't access it. Mm. Um, it looked like it was just a list of nouns of game mechanics and then descriptions for them as well. And then it's not till much later in the project, I was just like fiddling around with how menus were being loaded. And I saw that the code that loads menus is basically just like it's a programming function that takes a number as a parameter that says what menu is loading. And I found that there was a gap like, there was a number that just wasn't being used in any of the normal parts of the game. So I tried calling that function with the unused number, and then the memo screen came up. Interesting. Um, okay. So we kind of discovered it by accident like that. And it turns out that the VWF that we had used for other parts of the game also worked on the memo screen. Oh, so lucky. <laughs> That's so lucky. So That's really interesting. It, we actually needed very little additional hacking to make it work. In fact, the only thing I remember that we needed to do was the spacing was off. Um, like vertically, they were too tight together, so we had to increase the spacing so that um, the text would line up with the little bubbles on the background. Mm -hmm. And I think we might have had to hack it to be able to display more text for the descriptions, but it was really minor. And we, and that's actually part of the reason why we even included it in the hack, because if it had taken a ton of effort, we, we wouldn't have bothered, because we had we didn't really have schedule, but we want to get right. the game out as fast as possible, and we don't want to be spending two months on the stupid memo screen. But because it was so low effort and so neat, we decided to just do it. 
Yeah, and there's like a lot of unused like materials such as like the kindness attribute or, yeah. or some of the exactly. things in there. And it kind of left some insight of like what the game may have been before. Um, like for instance, we've done a lot of research with uh, Earthbound 64 and we don't know like mm -hmm. if maybe say a kindness attribute is in that game too. But you know, it kind of it kind of gives us a window to look into what you know Mr. Atoy had for for the game. So uh, it's really cool that you guys implemented that back in and, and left it there for us as a as sort of a, like a historical relic of mm -hmm. uh, you know what the game could have been. Yeah, it's um yeah it was really cool to to find stuff like that. Um, in terms of things I could still be improved upon, I I regret that we released with a couple bugs like known bugs obviously there's gonna be bugs you don't know about but there were a couple glitchy things that we left in there just because we didn't know how long it they were gonna take to fix and mm -hmm. in hindsight they were actually quite quick to fix um lorenzo one released a patch 1.3 with these things fixed but it was the uh when you finish naming your characters and it, when it f the screen fades out like the sound is really yeah, glitchy. Did it, did it, did it, did it, yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it's doing that because it keeps every single frame to redrawing the text, and because mm. our variable with font code is a lot more CPU intensive than what was there before. It just it lags the game so much that it messes up the sound. Um, the other thing we left in there was in the memo screens when you're if you move the cursor around too fast, you'll get some glitches. Um, and then there were a couple other things too that were a lot more difficult that we just didn't look into. Like we had to add a whole system of articles in front of nouns because mm -hmm. Japanese doesn't have that. They don't have right. the or n. We had to add that. <laughs> yeah. And um, there were a few rare, hard to reproduce cases where it would just get mixed up. It would say the flint ate a nut or something. something <laughs> yeah. Like that. Um, yeah. And then Lorenzo one, I think, ended up. Again, he's been, he's been championing a, a lot of the Mother 3 hacking post-translation. Um, he found and fixed a bunch of those. Mm -hmm. Cool, cool. Well, now I have the big question. So, it's been known Nintendo of America was aware of the fan translation, with some employees even voicing their support. Did you ever have an interaction personally from somebody with a Nintendo, whether it was positive or negative? So, I... I didn't directly have an interaction with anyone, but do you know about the the letter we got like the day before we released it? Yes, I've heard about it, yeah. but enlighten the audience if they don't know. <laughs> so I was looking this up recently. It was one or two days, like not exaggerating, right before we released the patch in October 2008, we got this letter um, from someone who was anonymous, but who claimed mm -hmm inside the industry um, and from the way they wrote and the language they used and whatnot we didn't have any reason to believe that that wasn't true we didn't have any reason to believe that it was a hoax or anything like that um, mm -hmm. and I think Clyde or someone did some some analysis of like where the email came from and the headers and IP addresses or whatever um, mm -hmm. It was not from North America. I forget now where it was from. It might have been from hmm. Japan, actually. But um, so it it seemed like a legitimate letter. Um, but basically, it was a very intricately written letter urging us not to release it. Um, hmm. It basically said, "I don't have it in front of me," but one of the they basically said we're stepping on people's toes. Uh, because the quality of the translation was so high. <laughs> <laughs> they actually that's, said that. That's impressive. Um, oh. <laughs> that it, it was so high that up. we were stepping on people's toes and that if we release it, <laughs> there would be no point, essentially, in anyone in any official release of it because the translation, the fan translation was so good. So much good, yeah. <laughs> that's so um, funny. Okay. That's kind of how I feel about the fan translation yeah. now. It's, it's so yeah, good, I don't think got... an official one could really live up to it, honestly. Well, right. then you got localizations like, you know, Fire Emblem Fates, which... Oh, boy. You know... <laughs> yeah. The quality so, here is definitely a big difference. <laughs> yeah, so it's like we got this letter and we all freaked out for a little bit. And, like, for a long time, 
if you remember, we had a notice or a disclaimer on our, our, our blog saying, Nintendo, if you want to shut this down, go right ahead and we'll do it. No questions asked. Yeah. Um, and I think, because... like, I think, not sorry to interrupt you, but I also think that there was also a disclaimer that today, hey, Nintendo, if you want to use this in a, an official whatever, go right ahead. You know, yep, um, that too. And yeah. it's like we, we had that disclaimer because, like, stepping on people's toes is the exact opposite of what we want to do, even though right. naively it's kind of inevitable when you do something like that. But still, it's like this is the last thing we wanted to see after all that work. Mm -hmm. um, so I we believe it was someone from either in or very closely related to to Nintendo. But at the end of the day, it was it was signed anonymously. We had really had no way to verify who it came from or in what capacity they're able to tell us to stop. So we we ignored it and continued on. Um, but it was, <laughs> that was a scary thing to receive that late in the game. Yeah, mm -hmm. of course. I think the disclaimer is still on there to this day, too. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so uh, while you were looking through the Mother 3 ROM, we all know it has it had a lot of unused things in it and there are still things being discovered in it what mm -hmm. sorts of things did you personally come across and did any of those things specifically leave a lasting impression on you so i one funny little thing i came across it was a little after the project when i was diving into the game to to document how it worked i was working on the the psi animations I think I was working on it for someone else. Someone had asked me if I could rip them from the ROM, so I decided looking into it. And there was a PSI animation in there that I think it was just like a test animation or something, but it was the annoying old party man sprite from Earthbound. <laughs> just just like pulsating on the screen. Oh wow, I don't so think I've just... seen that. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a video somewhere on my YouTube, I can link it after, but it's 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 very short, it's very brief, it's only a couple frames, it's not that uh nothing exciting but i just thought it was kind of funny to see something like that while i was digging through <laughs> um and yeah of course there's all there's the unused stuff that's like really freaky when i right. i was looking at the battle backgrounds too and there's i think there's some unused battle backgrounds that are like really freakish looking of, of klaus there's one of him yeah. like with the with the weird eyes and then there's another where he kind of looks like a ghost, so it makes you wonder how much darker the original story must have been. Like, I'm pretty yeah. sure, obviously, we're not playing the first draft of the Mother 3 story. We're playing no. some <laughs> later iteration of it, based on all yeah. the unused stuff. Oh, so, and like, he totally you always said wonder the... how dark it used to be. Yeah, he mm -hmm. totally did say one of the earlier drafts, uh, he was considering no dialogue at all in the final battle. Mm -hmm. mm, yeah. There was, like, also sections, like, in... Tanitane Island, for example, where it was extreme, at least according to a toy, he extremely toned it down because it gave him nightmares or yeah, something. <laughs> yeah, freaked out. And... and it's already pretty <laughs> freaky as it is now. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'm sure your perspective on the game might differ from Mr. A Toy does since he was, you know, a developer of the game and uh you know i know one thing you would like to do is is try to break the game in many creative ways but do you ever do you ever go back and play mother 3 as the player you know um you know what's your honest opinion after being one of the one of the major contributors to the fan translation so it's kind of funny i never during the project i I played the game kind of in pieces and not in the right order because we had to hack, you know, different parts of the game at different times. Um, and I didn't actually complete a full start to finish continuous playthrough of it till really late in the project. Um, but I, I, yeah, I have played it a couple times just as is, you know, not trying to think about the hacking or anything like that, just trying to play it as a game not on my computer, I set it up on like an emulator on a flashcard or something, so it's a bit more genuine. Um, I, I mean, it's a really good game. It's it's hard to to criticize it deeply. I think it's it's so well written, it's so polished. Uh, you know, just the animations, even though it's on the Game Boy Advance, which is visually 
almost the same as the Super Nintendo, so it's easy to compare it to Earthbound and say that the animations are so much more fluid, so much more emotional. Um, it didn't, like, it didn't give me the same feelings as, I guess, Earthbound did. Um, and that is probably because when I played Earthbound, I played it growing up as a kid, it probably had a much different impact on me as any game I would ever play as an adult. Um, but I do think Mother 3 is objectively a really good game overall. It's a shame that it came out so late in the Game Boy Advance's life cycle. It seems to be the curse of Mother games. Um, <laughs> but it, yeah, it's, I think it's a really good game. Awesome. I think we can all agree with that. <laughs> I definitely agree. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Especially the part where he says, you know, it's a curse for the Mother series to like <laughs> basically release a game towards the end of a console's life cycle. So it's two uh, out of three. Yeah, two out of three. E yeah. Even Mother One was like nearing the end. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nineteen eighty nine. Yeah. The one of part one of the, the last my Earthbound beginnings came out on the yeah. Wii U. <laughs> One of the one of the last like final games that they made for the uh, the Famicom was like I think um, one of, like one of, one of the Fire Emblem games like I think it was Fire Emblem Gaiden which was like 1992 oh, right, on right. Famicom yeah. and I was like oh my lord you know the, the Super Famicom's already out what, what do you what sh yeah you know? it was discontinued <laughs> in '94 in Japan I believe mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is yeah. pretty crazy oh, yeah, you know that's not like two levels but it's getting up there. Mm -hmm. So, you've been helping out on a Mother 1 plus 2 Fran translation for a number of years now. What's your involvement with that project? Uh, yes, number of years. That's, <laughs> that's, an, under, that's an understatement. Huge um, understatement. <laughs> I think the very, very first time I tried touching it was during the Mother 3 project. Oh, wow. So this is going back probably at least 12 years. Um, it's been on and off, certainly, over those years, just because it's so hard. <laughs> um, I, I was, wor I started working on it seriously when I was, I was in university, so I was, I didn't have a lot of free time, at least compared to when I worked on the Mother 3 project. So, Mother 1 plus 2 is a very difficult game to hack. It's, it's like, it's got a lot of the problems that we faced in Mother 3, but like, times 10 because like you really do have to do a separate variable with font for every single window every single sub window the battles everything it's just a really big pain um so i've been trying to drive it for a long time and knowing that i would eventually hit a wall where i just wouldn't have time to work on it anymore i put a lot of effort into developing kind of like a framework and a set of tools for other people to contribute. Um, one of the biggest problems I had with the with the game was that like we have this English translation from Earthbound and I wanted to use that, but it was in a totally different format from Mother 1 plus 2's text system. So I, I couldn't just import it directly and I couldn't find a good way to line up like the control codes or anything like that. So what I did is I developed a tool that would let anyone or like anyone without really deep programming knowledge to be able to manually import text from Earthbound. Um, and I was really surprised by the amount of people who took interest in it because it, it did pick up and a lot of people were contributing to it. There's a whole list of people who, who helped out and we actually got the whole thing pretty much done text-wise. Um, in the sense that we got all of that text imported from Earthbound into the Mother 1 plus 2 system. And why that was a bottleneck was because it's really hard to test any variable with font programming if you don't have any text to test it on. So it was really crucial that we got all that English text converted and imported into the project. So once that was done, I was able to continue again on the, on the programming part and go into the variable with fonts and I got it's a maybe 80% of it done um, there's a lot of little edge cases sub windows that you almost never see that still have to be done um, there's still bugs obviously the game is not polished but it is 
mostly playable from start to finish in its current state. Um, I just don't have a lot of time to work on it lately, and I feel bad about that, but I'm trying to, like, I'm still merging pull requests when I get them. I'm helping out where I can, but it's really hard for me to find time to work on it, but a lot of the other people who are working on it right now are doing a really good job with it. Um, and I'm really happy with that, and I'm really impressed by that. So I'm, I'm excited for where it's going. It's definitely active and thriving. There's a huge uh, Discord community around it, actually. Um, that's quite active, so it, it's really cool. Yeah, we know some of the people involved, and it's interesting, because 1 plus 2 back in the day, the fan community just tore it apart for its issues, but nowadays there are a lot of passionate people who really support One Plus Two and want more people to, you know, get introduced to it through these new translations. So it's crazy how that that opinion has changed over time because of this. Yeah, yeah it's it's kind of weird because I the sound like the biggest criticism I've heard is by far like the issues with the sound and the music, and it's just never really bothered me. I mean, it, it's a Game Boy game; it's going to sound different. Um, could they have done better? Maybe. Well, yeah. Like, there are people who are actually hacking the sound now and importing, like, Earthbound samples into the game, and it sounds a lot better, but it still never bothered me that much to begin with, so it's strange that people got turned off from it because of that, because I think the upside of being able to play it portably, and at the time, and for a really long time, that was the only way to do it, um, vastly outweighs... Uh, a slight downgrade in sound quality to me. Yeah, and and for me, like it, it's still the only current way to play Mother One on the go, and yep. you know, Mother One's sound chip and like sound quality on the NES and Famicom wasn't as great. Uh, so hearing it on the GBA actually sounds a little bit better for me, at least at least mm -hmm. in my opinion. Um, I don't know regarding like say how many sound channels it has or or what what it uses. Uh, now, but in my personal opinion, I think the GBA version for Mother 1 in particular is um, a big improvement over the original Famicom version. For instance, they, they implemented the run button. Um, mm -hmm. The original Famicom version didn't have that. Uh, and I think they also might have removed the uh, the map item and you know registered it to the start button like they yes. did in the like they did in Earthbound for you know Earthbound beginnings. So, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of very, very uh, nice, very, very odd, like, you know, features moved from the, you know, the localization to the, to the mother two, one, one plus two. So it's kind of, yeah. it's kind of strange in a way, but I, I kind of enjoy that because, it, you know, they took Phil Sandhoff's like ideals and, and criticisms to heart and they actually did, you know, implement some of those things into the, the re-release of the game. So yeah, yeah, that was I always thought that was pretty neat. Mm -hmm. That that reminds me actually when um when Mother Three was released for the Virtual Console, we actually uh, not me personally, but someone in the Earthbound hacking community dumped the ROM. Oh wow! And we were able to see if there were differences in it, and there actually were. Mm -hmm. Um, but they were very mm -hmm. minor. It was like there was a lightning animation that they changed. Um, oh. Yeah, and like the I timing think... of like, uh, I think the lightning strikes during the bony cutscene in chapter one, I think that was changed. Yeah. Yeah. Very yeah, minor they that, things. And they, they changed very close to the end of the game when you're fighting the boss, they changed some of the lightning strikes from there too. It, probably because of like seizure warnings or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know they did that with uh, Earthbound, I think, with some of the PSI animations. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, they definitely softened it a bit. Yeah, I think it's also accommodated to the Wii U Virtual Console's kind of darker filter on those games. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it yeah. might be a creative thing as well. Who knows? <laughs> so how does working with uh, 1 plus 2 compare to working with 3? Do you feel your experience with uh, the Mother 3 fan translation influence your approach to Mother 1 plus 2? I think it, yeah, I think that uh, the, I think it influenced it for sure. Um, a lot of the like little programming techniques I learned on the Mother 3 project I was able to apply to this. Um, I was able to make better decisions I think about where I spend my hacking time. Like One of the things that we burned a lot of time on in 
the Mother 3 project was just like fiddling around with the assembly code and you you build it and it doesn't work because you made a typo or something dumb like that. Programming an assembly code is really a lot different than programming in other traditional languages. Um, so one thing I did differently with Mother 1 plus 2 is I found a way to like compile C code into the project so that it didn't have to be all assembly. And that allowed me to... It. I had spent a lot of time making that work, but it also saved a lot of time in the end. Um, so I only did that because I knew from my experience on Mother 3 that the trade-off would be justified. Um, and again, Mother 1 plus 2 is just its a much harder game to hack. The programming is just much different. There are a lot of places where I'm like, what were the programmers thinking? Um, like <laughs> there are there are certain windows where, like text windows, where it's re-rendering the entire window on every single frame, it completely needlessly. Um, like this is really low technical details, but that makes it really hard when you're developing a variable with font which uses a lot more CPU cycles. Um, it kind of glitches out the game a bit, and then you have to find workarounds, and it just it all gets kind of complicated and hairy. So, I also find that the game's data is not structured as well compared to Mother 3. Um, with Mother 3, I mentioned earlier that the data structures have headers, and they're nice and packed together. Uh, in Mother 1 plus 2, it's nothing like that. It's all just kind of haphazard, scattered around. Um, yeah, so a lot of little things like that make it more difficult. Yeah, I guess you get the impression maybe perhaps the game was rushed. I mean, I think the developers aren't even credited in the game. Oh, really? I didn't know yeah. that. Yeah, uh, people think it was perhaps Pax Sofnica who did develop uh, Mother 1, but I don't think there's any evidence of that from what I can tell. Yeah, I mean... That's that's something that we saw like like on a on some of the articles or like some of the stuff that's like on Wikipedia, like where they had Paxsoft like credited, but like when you look into the actual credits of the game, they're not no, they're not even there. There's nothing. Yeah, <laughs> it's really strange. There so were some um, weird bugs too. Like I remember there was a bug where you can kill a Gygus with the snake or something. Yeah. Like poisoning. yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, that was a very odd odd glitch. I remember watching a video on, uh, I think, Starman.net's YouTube channel showing off that glitch. There's also the getting the uh, the Flying Man out of out of Magicant. That glitch is still there from the original game. So it's 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 strange little glitch. I think the bread glitch is patched, though. I don't, I'm yeah, not and sure Rock Candy. Rock and the Rock Candy gone. glitch, yeah. That's completely gone, too. Um, so... Uh, Jeff, man, what's your everlasting memory with the the Mother series? Like, is there a favorite moment? You know, one of your favorite characters, quotes, anything In like the that? Game, probably, mm -hmm. probably when I beat it, Earthbound for the first time. Earthbound um, for the first time. Yeah, it was a kind of an emotional moment for me because it I had spent so many years trying to beat it, and it was such a game that was so close to me. In my mm -hmm. upbringing, that when I finally beat it, it was it, it affected me quite a bit in a good way. Um, so I won't forget that. And outside the game, I'd I'd say Camp Fan Gamer was just yeah, like I said, it was surreal. Um, it was just a really really cool experience overall. That's it's hard to describe, I guess. Um, I guess you mm -hmm. were there, but. Yeah, it was a really special experience for me, too. Yeah, hopefully uh, yeah. we'll get that chance again someday. <laughs> yeah, hope so. Maybe, we, would, we, would maybe. Love to, we would love to do something similar or anything like that, but we realize, you know, like, while we're starting off small and, you know, the fundraising and all that other sort, it, it's, a lot of, um, it's a lot of investment to, to consider. So, you know, seeing Fangamer, I, what was it, like three or four times that they did Camp Fangamer, or, or was it like maybe two? I, I think it was, it was three. I think it's been three. three. I only went to okay. the first one. Um, okay. But yeah. Yeah, that, you know, I can I can only imagine it would be very, very um, costly, you know, for, for that sort of, uh, uh, you know, event. So, 
Yeah, we'll see where the future takes us. Yeah. But for now, let's enjoy this interview and the website that's coming out. <laughs> of course, <laughs> <Right>? yeah. <laughs> but never underestimate the mother community. We'll see where things go. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, what are your current projects, Jeff Mann? Do you aspire to one day pursue a job within the industry, if you haven't already? So, I'm aside from the Mother 1 plus 2 project, I'm not working on anything Mother-related. Um, I'd really love to make a hack one day, just to finally use all these tools, because I've never really made a hack. I only made tools, but um, like I've wanted to make a creepypasta hack for the longest time, and I just haven't had time. <laughs> I think that would be so cool. You, like a you, really good Earthbound Creepypasta hack would just be so cool to play, I think. Um, I, I just don't have the time, though. So, um, yeah. So you mentioned a Creepypasta hack. You have you have no idea how many times I've heard so many people, you know, wished for some sort of Creepypasta written about <laughs> Earthbound, some Creepypasta game. You know, I've seen I've seen a lot of examples where people wish that there was an Earthbound hack similar to like the Ben Drowned one and, and, and all this other stuff. And I was like, yeah, that'd be really cool for like some Halloween thing going on or whatever. <laughs> so hearing that from you is just the most <laughs> interesting thing <laughs> to me. It's surreal because we were yeah. literally talking about that yesterday with we our We were, <laughs> we were. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great though? Like it's uh, maybe I'm just living under a rock. I don't think any have been released, but like you think after all this time, someone would have done it. But yeah. um, I haven't, I haven't come across anything. No, the closest thing, of course, is the Halloween hack, but that's not exactly yeah. the same idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and in terms of industry, I, I'm not, I don't speak any Japanese or anything, so I don't. I don't think I could pursue a job in, in that, but uh, certainly in programming, I, I work full-time as a developer now, and I intend to keep doing that because I really like it. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, how long have you been doing that officially? Officially, almost four I spent a lot of time in school. I, I finished up in 2016. Um... Before then, I had gotten some internships at a few places. Uh, a couple of them were software. Uh, some of my internships actually got because of the Mother 3 translation. I, I went out on a limb and put wow. it on my resume when I was interviewing. <laughs> and I, I found a company that actually liked that kind of thing. Because you, you always got to be careful with that, right? Because it's a legal gray area, obviously. Mm -hmm. Not everyone's going to be appreciative of that kind of thing. Um, but others might. So I took a chance and it worked out for me. That's really Fan cool. projects to pay off, I guess. <laughs> That's really cool. Like you can <laughs> have like, you know, maybe a friend or or, or you know children or anything. Be like, yeah, my first job, I I, I did this fan translation. And they were like, oh, that's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's it's yeah, it was really cool. Like uh, to be able to work on it, and then it had like a like a chain reaction almost. Like it got me that mm -hmm. first. Which led to the second one, which led to the third one, and so on and so forth. Right. So it's, it's helped me quite a bit in that way. Yeah, I wonder if uh, things would be different today, because Nintendo's mentality towards these <laughs> sort of projects has certainly changed. Yeah, there was the, um, what was it, the Secret of Mana or something trilogy that came out. Like, mm -hmm. that one had a game in it that hadn't been translated till that point, so you never know. There might still be hope. <laughs> Yeah, who knows? Well, yeah. uh, we want to... Uh, does anybody else have anything else to add? No, I think uh, we covered just about every base. Go for it, yeah, man. Go for it, yeah. All right. Well, we want to thank you very much for your time coming on here and talking to us, Jeff Man. Um, our last question is, uh, where can people find you on social media? And uh, if they wish to follow you for in the future and uh, for any updates for your projects, and is there anything you'd like the mother community to know as a closing statement? Uh, so I can, I've got a Twitter account that I pay attention to. I don't post much, but you can easily reach me through there at Jeffman19. Um, I'm active on Discord as well through the, the Mother Forever Discord or the Mother 1 Plus 2 Translation Discord. I'm active in both of those. Or I, I read them. I don't say much, but I am there. <laughs> um, so rest assured, I'll, I'll respond if you try to contact me through that. Um, and 
yeah, closing words. Uh, thanks a lot for having me on here. Um, really appreciate it. It's always fun to talk about this and reminisce about the translation and the series. It's really great to see that it's still thriving. The community is still growing. There's constantly new people being introduced to the game, which I think is really amazing considering it's been out actually for a really long time now. Even Mother 3 has been out for 14 years almost. Kind of crazy. Um, so yeah, just uh, Mother Community is one of the passionate communities I've been a part of. So thanks for kind of revitalizing it, I guess. <laughs> um, <laughs> looking forward to to what's coming in the future with uh, Mother Forever and uh, good luck with the launch. No, let me tell you, we're just Thanks crazily so obsessed people. <laughs> we're very, very <laughs> obsessed with the Mother series. But it's been an honor having you here, and, and thank you so much for your kind words. We, we really appreciate it, and I'm hoping that this uh, launch goes very well. Um, this is all being pre-recorded, of course. Oh, wait, I'm not <laughs> supposed to tell anybody that. <laughs> we're live. We're, we're live. live. That's right. That's right. We're live. <laughs> all right, so... Once again, thank you so much, and um, we'll, we would love to have you here on, a, on another podcast or something in the future or, or whatever, whenever comes first. Um, but that's the Jeff Mann interview. There he is. He's a great man. He did the <laughs> Mother 3 fan translation. <laughs> He's my superhero. Me. He's my superhero, of course. Oh, me too. <laughs> <laughs> All right.